All right. Well, welcome back, Watch fans. We've got a special episode for you today. We have the king of wind of the king of wind. I was going to say the king of, of vintage, Eric like Wind. That. Eric Wind of uh, Wind Vintage. Eric, welcome to our special program today. Thank you for having me, Jack. It's an honor to see you again. So we're going to be talking all things vintage, uh, what, all the, the hottest trends in vintage, your background, and we'll also you know, show some watches that are available for sale, right? Avail Perfect. Available for purchase. Not for sale, for purchase, right? For purchase. Yeah, exactly. No, it's good. Possibly, yeah. possibly. Yeah. Possibly. So, Eric, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll get some questions from, from the punters, some questions, and uh, which you'll answer about you know things in vintage. We'll talk about Rolex, Patek, Universal, Genève, even mm -hmm. Omega, even Omega, right? Or you know. Uh, so, Eric, before we get into it, uh, we'll do we'll do the wristwatch check because that's what that's what the kids like. They like the wristwatch. Yeah. You go first. What are you wearing? Uh, I've got a beautiful, actually have it sitting on my desk, but it's a uh, Rolex reference 6090 in pink gold with the diamond dial circa 1952 to 53. And uh, unpolished case, it has these beautiful Bombay lugs, oyster case, uh, just a really exceptional watch. How's so, the buckle? Uh, is, it a, is it a Rolex buckle? It's not. Uh, at this moment, I think I have a pink gold buckle, but I can't, wait, 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 no, how, how, isn't that, isn't that like a disgrace to Rolex not I, to have a Rolex buckle? I just got it back uh, from my watchmaker, so I got to dig out a buckle. I do have a buckle. That, is that is that yours, or is that or is that available for sale? Uh, it's available for sale. We just listed it this morning on WinVintage.com. So it's a really how much really. Is, and what's the uh, price? This is nine, nineteen thousand uh, dollars. Nineteen. It's okay. Really exceptional piece. I mean, I've, I haven't okay. seen another exactly like it. Oh, we'll cool. get oh, we'll get we got a couple of interesting watches. So I'm wearing. You ready for this, Eric? I, I I was in Miami a while back, and I was like in South Beach area. I'm walking along that boardwalk, you know, and uh, you know, right where they have the Art Deco, the, the hotels, like the Colony, and all that. Yeah. And some guy comes up to me with like a raincoat. He opens up, and says, "Hey, you want to buy a Rolex?" I mean, this was during the Miami Beach show, right? Oh, wow. and I say, and he had this. So I, and I got this. I think it's mm. a chronograph. Is this legit? <laughs> <laughs> Looks fake to me. No, it's uh, it's the it's a really a spectacular watch. And uh, you know, very crisp. Uh -huh. You know, I, and I think I, and the strap. This is a this is a wind vintage strap. I love this that is, watch. It's so cool. I no, Eric. Yeah, no. This is it's been great. No, I actually no. I, so all kidding aside, because you know, a lot of people in the audience they don't understand humor. No, I actually I bought this watch from Eric Wind. So I'm actually I'm yes. actually a customer. I'm not just you know. This is like I'm, I actually I actually bought from this guy, uh, and and wait, so the watch is great, very crisp. You know, I wear it. You know, I, I do. I have to wear it under a cuff to protect it. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Because it's, because it's you know I, I love these turnographs. Uh, I have one which is like an everyday, but this one I got to wear under a cuff so I don't scratch. We'll talk about. It. And and the best part is I got this pouch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The wind vintage pouch. Which has got uh, no. This is like super high quality. You know, I'm I'm very picky about stuff. Like I like, you know, really high quality. And this is like, I don't know who makes this for you, but this is like incredible. That's awesome. Thank you so much. It was good. No, this is this is uh, unbelievable. Uh, we got some. So we'll say hello to the punters. We got Watch Lux. Hello, Watch Lux. Uh, stunning vintage. Roy. Not my watch is. I don't know. My watch is not as good. It's uh It's not quite as good. As, actually, I don't oh, know, Eric. Would you say? If we went head to head, turnograph versus historically, more it's a little apples to oranges. Yours is a great like daily wear watch and water resistant. This is much older, so probably not water resistant. We got G Marx. Uh, ciao, G Marx. Uh, Como esta? Okay, yeah. so here we go. All right, let's get into it. Let's get into it. One question I want to ask, what's happening, you know, like we keep hearing, oh, the watch market, you know, there's a guy, you know, there's a famous guy in your neighborhood who says, the watch, you know, he's famous for the watch market is dead. You know that guy? He's, I think, in Miami. No, who is that? There's a guy, no, for new, for new, new, mar, new models, yeah. but what's happening? No, definitely, look, in the last, you know, there was a big bubble. Things got crazy with, you know, the modern watches, but what's happening in vintage? Like, you're, you're, you know, you've got your pulse on the market, you know, you're, you're buying, you're selling watches all the time. 
We've seen what's happening in office. What's your take on what we're seeing in, in vintage? The vintage market has been pretty stable for the last decade almost. It's kind of just been, you know, slight growth, uh, if you will. Uh, I've got to do it backwards for your for the camera, but you know. Whereas the modern watch market went like this, the vintage watch market's kind of been creeping up at a lower tick. Their biggest trend, I would say, is the understanding of condition. So the originality, people, the term unpolished basically didn't exist like ten years ago. Referring to cases, people didn't really use that or care about that. Um, now there's a lot more focus on you know, unpolished cases, um, dials that are unrestored, really original raw pieces like yours, uh, Jack, which is very hard to find. It's like one out of 100 vintage. Uh, I bought it to me because it was, it was so crisp. I, I mean, like I was like, I wasn't in the market, but it was like, I was up the Miami beach show and I see, got, I, was like, yeah. I gotta have, you know, it's the, the, the only, it's, yeah, it's the only gold unpolished one I've had or even really seen to be honest. So it's, uh, it's already a rare reference. And then to have that condition on top is insane. So that that's the big, the biggest trend. People understand condition. Now they're hunting for condition versus hunting for the reference itself. Um, and that's a good thing overall. It's a more educated buyer's market. They're not just buying things that look good. They want to understand the condition and provenance and, you know, the rarity of a model. It's all very good. How, let me see, if I had to ask, what's what's more important, like case condition or dial condition? Is that is that asking two different things? Like, because, you know, sometimes you see these, I notice like a lot, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Patek, you know, 70s Patek. Yeah. You know, I like, I like the ellipse and a lot of times you see that, this flaking, they flake, the yeah, dials yeah. flake. Yeah. AP is notorious, like AP, like the 70s, you know, the dress walk, they have flaking. Uh, yeah. Even look at, I don't know, what's, but what's more important, the condition of the case, the dial, is it both? What would you say if you had to choose? It depends on the model. And in general, you know, people don't want uneven aging. So if it's even and there's kind of, say, for a, dial there's kind of even aging across the dial that's more acceptable if it's just only on half of the dial that might be hard um, some of those blue dials have issues where it kind of goes copperish or in some cases it almost looks like worms are eating the dial people call that vermicelli which means worms in in italy and Do you know uh, what i love uh, yeah yeah you know what i love i love that you know the, in the last couple of years whatever the decade like all these these vintage guys are very good at marketing. So whatever the condition is, they make it seem like it's some sort of, <laughs> oh, it's a special, oh, it's hey. tropical. It's like exotic. It's like, it's, it's some sort of yeah. like, they make everything, they give a positive spin, almost like, like yeah. a real tour, you know? Like they give us, yeah, yeah, oh, exactly. there's, uh, there's a train passing by. No, no, it's part of the entertainment. For that. Yeah, exactly. There is, there is a level of that. Yeah. Exactly. It's accessible. You can hop on the train if needed. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's the, that it's gotta be even, I would say, you know, if it's an even perfect brown dial, that's super desirable versus a lot of what people call tropical are like water damage dials where there's clear, it's like water spots all over it. And, uh, that's not so attractive, obviously, because it means the tile's been damaged. So, uh, yeah, it's you're, kind of. You're a stickler. I mean, from what I mean, I think you're kind of a stickler for condition. Like you're very like you sell generally stuff which is in a really. I don't know if it's. I don't. I, well, how would you would you say top condition? It's better than you know. You don't sell stuff which has been like. I try not up. to. Yeah, I try to focus on top condition pieces. It takes a lot of time to hunt those down. It's not easy, and uh, it's what gets me excited to own myself and to buy and sell. And it's just not a commodity that you can just buy in top condition. It's super rare. And we're gonna show we're gonna show some watches which you know are av available for purchase, possibly, possibly. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know they want to go to the right homes. We want to want to make sure they go to the right homes. Uh, yes. We have got a couple of questions which we'll, we'll get into. So G Marks is asking. This is interesting. What is actually vintage? Just to make sure, what are we talking about when we say vintage? What are we talking about? We're talking about vintage, neo vintage. What is? Yeah. So traditionally, vintage referred to wine, and it referred to wine that was twenty years old or older. 
So um, that's kind of the starting point. Vint itself refers to 20. Um, so that that's the first thing. With watches, generally, it's been kind of late 1980s and older is considered vintage. Um, but, you know, the 90s are often called neo-vintage now. And, you know, as more time progresses, probably the 90s will be considered vintage and older. But with Rolex, what people kind of look for with vintage are those acrylic plastic crystals, like on your watch, four-digit references, always had the acrylic crystals if they're an oyster model. Um, those had kind of beautiful domes and different architecture than the sapphire crystals that were instituted in the late 70s and 80s on uh, most vintage Rolex watches. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. We, did it, we had a video the other day on, on a guy, uh, Billy Wow. Wow? W yes. Yeah, I saw oh, you saw that? that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah was, That's what I wanted to have. I wanted to have a Pepsi. That's why, because it's something to match. Yeah, a and funnily, yeah. I helped uh, Watches of Espionage identify those watches. Uh, oh, that's so funny. That's so funny. It's yeah. a great article. Yeah, I mean, it was a great article they wrote. Yeah, was and he was trying to figure out the day date that it's common, you know, particularly in the U.S. market, that people just bought these day dates and had diamonds stuck on them and aftermarket diamond bezels. It was like the majority of them being sold in New York were being modified, I feel like, at the time. He, and bought, it, he, bought, it, he got it in Libya. He got it in exactly. Libya when he was working. Exactly. So it started in New York, and then it went elsewhere, and everyone began modifying it. Let so me ask so. you this. Now, are, are his what have, his watches, are they, what happened? Does his family own them? Are they selling? Or what's the deal? What would you say, what's I, the, what would you say I, those would be I, worth? I think they're still with the family. You know, it's... Uh, it's not like he's a household name. It's not. No, like no, it's, yeah. it's, it's not it's uh, like, like Paul Newman. Yeah, and Marlon Brando's GMT went for four point five million. <laughs> Christie's is not. I I think it'd be like maybe a thirty percent premium potentially yeah. on the value of the watch, which might be like twelve to fourteen thousand, and then you add thirty percent, so maybe it's seventeen to nineteen thousand. Yeah, exactly. And how, the, about his, now how about his day date? That was beaten with with the aftermarket diamonds. Yeah, that's a little. That's, that's a little still rough. like ten to thirteen thousand, maybe. You know, yeah. it's not. No one's gonna go so crazy about that one. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's no, not without it's, that. If it didn't, you know, if it didn't have that provenance, it might be just a little a bit above gold weight, no. which might be like yeah. six thousand or something. You know, there's not yeah. a lot of market for those. It's beaten. It's been beaten, but no, it's got. He's got crazy stories. I've uh, got uh, John saying, you know, John, John, great to see Eric Wind, so cigars sweet. and whiskey. That's so sweet. Sounds good, John. We got. Uh, let me see. We got uh, Chili Badger saying, "Is this the Eric that has the biggest collection of subs known to man?" Is that <laughs> you? It's not. Uh, when I did the reference points on the Submariner with Hodinkee, those were not all my watches. I wish I wish they were. It was probably $10 million on the table, but I sourced them all from collectors. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Eric, let me ask you, before we get into it, like, how, give us a little bit about your back. Like, how did you, you know, get into the business you're doing now, which is, you know, you're, you're a vintage dealer. You had a really interesting background career. Get, start us, how did you get into watches and fast forward, you know, like a quick summer, you know, Cliff Notes edition. Yeah, so I started uh, with my grandfather's Hamilton, which was a gift from my mom after he passed. It was a, originally a gift from my grandmother to my grandfather for their wedding in 1947. He had served in World War II in the Pacific under MacArthur, came back like so many other, uh, you know, veterans, had a, met a girl, had a family. So that was this, my first vintage watch. I always liked watches, but that was my first mechanical watch as well. Then I began reading online. The site called Hodinkee had started in 2008. I came across it, which was the same summer I received the watch, just began reading about watches. Uh, and then basically by 2010, I was pretty obsessed with watches. I began writing for Hodinkee just because I was pestering the founder, Ben Clymer, with different cool things I was seeing online. Then. Uh, Fast forward, I was writing a lot as the years went on, and I joined. I was recruited to go to Christie's as vice president, senior specialist of watches in 2015. 
I had finished an MBA at Oxford during that time before then. And were you, really were you, I think you went to school for like uh, diplomatic stuff, something like you were going to be yeah, a diplomat. Under, yeah, undergrad, I went to the School of Foreign Service in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, then I did an MBA. Were you gonna join, Were you going to join the agency? Uh, probably not, but I, uh, I enjoyed, I, I've got, it's cool being in DC cause you know, people in all different places. It's a very interesting city. It then, is. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Then I basically was with Christie's realized I had a lot of clients who wanted my time, but I had no time to give them. So I decided to, um, start my own business. The rest is history. Let me ask you, when you're a specialist at Christie's, I, I know like diff, like in the in the watch department, right? What is yeah. what is really your job? Like, you know, give me like a typical day is like, you know, what, what do you do? Are you, are you trying to get consignments? Are you basically catalog? What, what, what is the specialist, the, the watch specialist at Christie's? Yeah, it really comes down to three words, which is source and then research and sell. So you've got to find watches for sale. Part of that is a whole stream of things that people email you every day. You've got the estate department at Christie's sending you leads of stuff from estates, you know, clients that you might know contacting you, wanting to sell stuff, collectors, things like that, and then just kind of cold leads, people writing in. Um, so they really care about the property getting the property for sale. And then you've got to write about it. You've got to order extracts from Patek Philippe, et cetera, get those in, yeah. add that to the listing. Then you've got to uh, make sure people bid and try to get bids on it. So that's really it. Every day it was trying to find property to sell at auction and close you know, many times it's competitive. So someone might contact Christie's, Sotheby's, and yeah, they always. That's I, you know, it's I remember because I, I was in that business, but on the art side, not not Christie's. Yeah, my own thing. And it was always when you get something by email, you know, the guy's talking to, you know, Bonhams, Christie's, you know, Doyle, you know, whatever yeah, local yeah, guys yeah. Of the day, you know, yeah. shopping it around. You know, and if it's something that's average, you just kind of make your pitch. But if it's <laughs> really exceptional then you really gotta hunt you gotta yeah. pursue it chase it very hard to make sure you get it what what percentage of the time when a guy contacts you like something comes in is it like a collection so in other words like you know he's got he's got maybe 10 watches that you know and you want to get this because again he's contacting yeah. phillips and suddenly you know like how, you want to close the deal how do you get that deal and how often does that happen where you get like this really good collection percentage wise yeah most of the time it's kind of one-off watches or a couple watches, but there's always the collections, which everyone focuses on. They're trying to get the best deal in terms of the lowest percentage and best marketing and everything else. So it's a, it's a give and take. And sometimes they go to one auction house and they, they tell you they offered this, can you offer this? And you need to run it up the chain yeah, to get yeah. it approved. Um, you know, it's, it's a that those collections can be big, obviously millions of dollars, yeah. depending on what they have, and it can be a make or break for a season, really. That's oh, really? really? How, what's how, like? What's the biggest collection that you've uh, brought in, like in terms of you know, for consignment? What's dollars? Yeah, uh, several million. They've had it since I left in 2017. Some collections that are 20 or 30 million dollars, which is, you know, that's can be like a, you know, a quarter of your revenue for the year for the watch department so it's uh you got to make sure you close those things <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and how many how many watches would you be looking at a typical day like coming over the transom so to speak between all the leads how many watches are you looking at a typical day uh over a hundred i would say yeah between emails texts and ebay occasional small auctions etc i'm looking at or people are sending me um whatsapp it's it's a lot and you're looking at basically like every like also of i mean like you're seeing like really stuff that like people have never seen like yeah every once in a while like i'm looking at this auction i think it was uh sotheby's uh, the hong kong stuff and they got like you know stuff like crazy i was like one offs yeah. from patek whatever it's like you yeah. must have seen you must have had your eyes on probably how many watches how many dials have you seen in the last 10 years a million pop, a million years maybe not i mean a lot uh, yeah. you know probably close to a million honestly because yeah. um 
you know, even at Christie's, we were selling over 2000 watches a year and that was only a fraction of what I saw those years. So it's probably, a but you know what it is. I, I think the, the advantage of working at an auction is one of the big advantages you have over people like whatever is that you you're able to develop you know, pattern recognition skills because you have so much coming at you. All of a sudden yes. you see stuff that nobody's nobody has. I mean, there's no guys who are just getting into vintage. They don't have they don't have the advantage that you have. You know, it's kind of like because you know you've had literally you've seen 10x what they have, so you've got a 10x advantage yeah. basically. Yeah, you and know? I have a good. Uh, I'm blessed. I have I would say a photographic memory, so when I see something, I remember it, and it freaks out. Charlie Dunn, who works with me, because I'll say, I saw that watch like five years ago, and then I'll find a photo of it, or <laughs> I'll know exactly where it came from. Uh, there's a funny story, because we were talking to some uh, vintage dealer, and someone else had some watch that was like a project he was kind of putting together. And, you know, it's okay if you're transparent about it, but it was clear he wasn't going to be transparent about, you know, kind of Frankensteining this watch. And the guy asked someone else, so do you think I should talk to Eric Wind about this? I didn't even know who it was. And this other gentleman who I didn't know either said, I wouldn't show it to Eric Wind unless you want him to remember it until the day he <laughs> dies. <laughs> it was really funny. I was on the ground just dying laughing. <laughs> but then he said, I wouldn't even mention it to Eric unless you want him to remember it, let alone show him a photo. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's that's the no, actually, it's interesting. A lot of guys have in the business; they have really good memories, uh, like yeah. visual, visual memory. Now, how? No, when? So, when did you start uh, Wind Vintage? Uh, Two thousand seventeen. Uh, I was. I enjoyed Christie's, but it was clear. Obviously, I couldn't really help my clients build their collections, other than just try to sell them stuff I had in auction. I just didn't have time for it. It was really like drinking from a fire hose. So yeah. I had a lot of people that wanted my time. I had people that wanted to sell watches with me, but they didn't necessarily love giving up a commission to Christie's plus the 25% buyer's premium. So I kind of had the opportunity there. I took a leap of faith and uh, yeah, the rest has been history. It's been a lot of fun. Now, let me see you said that you want to help collectors build collections. Now, is that like, is that like marketing speak for every dealer says I want to help you? No, but is, or are you really interested in bu building, you know, what, Collection. Yeah, I mean, 99% of our clients, it's kind of a, you know, they're buying a few watches and maybe it's a small number of things, but there's people who come to me and basically are like, I'm ready to spend several million dollars on watches the next few years. And I want to build a great collection of stuff I love. Some some of it I'll wear, some of it I won't necessarily wear, but want to own. Can you help me? Let's find the best stuff. Obviously, that's very rewarding as well. And how many of those guys? How many of those? How many of those calls do you get a week? Not that many a week, but it's you know it's like a small number of clients that are would I would put in that category that are like spending north of a hundred thousand a year and trying to really build their collections and it's fun. You know, sometimes they tire of a watch and it's a journey because your your taste change with time and what you like changes a little bit. So sometimes you buy two things and sell three or buy two and sell one. And it's a, or, it's fun. Or you, you get a better example. Like, you know, I'm like, I had a yeah. turnograph, you know, my modest case I had it. And then I got a better one. Now I'm thinking, you know what, let me get rid of the, the one that's not such great. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you, is it fair to say that probably 80% of your business, is it always like that 80, 20, the Pareto, like, 80% of the business comes from that 20% of the, those customers who are like, you know, you're building those collections, actively building. Not, collections. yeah, not necessarily. Cause we do a lot of volume on our website, okay. honestly. Um, we're trying to focus on 10,000 and up dollar watches okay. because the under 10, we do, we do it, but it's a headache in many cases, as you can imagine, like it's a lot of work. It's the same amount of work, but it's often more work, you know. So okay. um, we try to, we're you know, just trying to be smarter in how we work. I would say. Okay. Okay. And what's the focus of the bit? The you know, like if somebody goes to the site, which we're gonna pull up. Like, what's like, what's your focus? Is it are you are you focused on brand? Like, is there like a f overall theme? Are you focused on brands, eras of watches, or what is your, like your kind of like niche? 
in general, it's kind of high quality Rolex if you had to tie it to one specific brand and category. But we do sell a lot of modern pre-owned watches, um, whether it's Rolex, Patek Philippe, Audemars, Piguet, et cetera. It's a big piece of business for us. Um, it's not like it's high margin, it's kind of low margin, but I was just, I hadn't really focused, that's a whole kind of category I built out because clients would come to me wanting to sell modern watches and I would sometimes wholesale them, but then I'd sell them to some of the big players and they'd mark it up like 20 or 30%, even though I was trying to get them the best price. And I was like, uh, and they were like, uh, so I just began selling it myself and my site syncs with Chrono 24. We try to be the lowest price on modern watches if possible. And you find buyers that way who are looking for a reputable place to purchase from and the watch that they want. So we, we do sell a lot of modern. Let's, let's do this. Let, let's, let's, let's interrupt the, 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 the Q and a part. We'll show some watches. We'll give examples. Let's, let's show and tell. Yeah, so yeah. I, um, I picked three watches from your site, which I think are interesting for the for the audience, right? And you picked yeah. three, right? Now, I don't know what you picked yet. I don't know what you picked, but uh, the first watch I picked, I'm going to pull it up. I'm going to pull it up on the screen right here, uh, and then we'll yep. also show it. So we've got, we have the uh, Rolex 6239. Yep. And this is different. I haven't seen. I'm not. I'm not a Daytona guy, but I don't know what. I've never seen anything like this. Like, what is? Is this? Tell us what's unique about this watch, and you want to also maybe show. I think you have it on. Oh, here we go. Hang on, let me let me get. Here we go. Okay. Yep. Here we go. Yes, okay. so on camera. A, yeah. Sorry, it's a Rolex uh, six two three nine, which is the earliest reference of Daytona. Um, this one is a very special. Dates to about nineteen sixty four, but if you look, it's got a brushed bezel, which is all, sometimes called sandblasted. Um, I'll pull it up most, on the picture. Yeah. They see they most, see better. Yeah, most of them, essentially all the rest of the steel bezels are polished typically, so it's shiny. Uh, this has kind of more of a stealthy look. The watch is so early; it doesn't say Daytona on it. The earliest Day Daytona has only said Cosmograph, not Daytona. The original name of the model was the Le Mans, so it's uh, kind of a funny funny little thing, but I think that, that or Le Mans, if you will, they didn't pronounce the S, but uh, Le Mans is the famous track in uh, France where they do the 24 hour of Le Mans every year endurance test. Um, and I think they thought Americans would have a hard time pronouncing it. So they decided to name it the Daytona shortly thereafter. Oh, they're so good at marketing. Yeah, they are so good. The same, you know, the famous track in Florida. So uh, this is an early example. The hands are thin and long, which you you only saw on the earliest ones. Um, the loom plots Ooh. are on. The, it's kind of cool. The loom plots are on the track versus right next to the hour markers. Um, it's just a very stealthy, very special, and super rare early watch. It has a very cool engraving on the back of the original owner's initials with a three. Below what does it, it say? Drive, drive carefully. <laughs> yeah. Drive carefully me, but, uh, it's got his initials followed by three. No, it's sure. Bring it up, bring it up, on, bring it up on camera again. Let's see the watch again. Sure. There we go. Okay. Can we see, see the back? The engraving? Yeah. Yeah. the engraving? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It says, uh, I believe HFS three right there. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's cool. Oh, three, the three sticks. Yeah, okay. The third. Yeah, exactly. And it's, oh, so uh, this is an aristocrat. This is not just, this yeah, is not yeah, exactly. this is a aristocrat. No, real, real aristocrat. Gentleman racer. Exactly. And it's a U.S. Uh, American made Jubilee bracelet. Um, so it's just a special watch. Yeah. Very clean, stealthy piece. We got a comment from P cars. Very clean dial is what they're saying. It, it's, that, that that's I, it's interesting you know the watches are like fashion right and i think with fat things are changing right i think there's a there's a real focus today people want almost like a minute I, I don't i hate the word minimalism but they do want like that kind of cleaner look that simplified look no they want something simple yeah exactly uh, it's stealth well for sure yeah yes yeah, so eric wind one of the most respected in all the vintage 
market, windvintage.com. Amazing. Did you That's pay so this sweet. guy, Eric? I, I wish. Yeah, thank you so much. So sweet. Uh, Zeppi. We got, no, we got serious, by the way, we got serious heavy hitters in the audience. Zeppi, Baron Zeppi, I should say. You know, we got, you know, real aristocrats in the audience. So we got, so this watch, so what we're looking at right here, this is available for, uh, is available 79,000. You, you have a special price for, for the members of this channel? Get in touch and we'll figure it out for sure. It has the original box and it has the original oh. box and receipt as well. And when the guy bought it, he wanted both the Jubilee bracelet and the oyster. So it's got both bracelet options as well from time of purchase. Cool. Oh wow! I I, you know, I I think you had that in the listing. And I forgot. So so you have so it comes with the box, the vintage box, yep. the original box. receipt from nineteen sixty six. So it probably sat in the store for like two years. Back Where did, in it, the day. did it get? It? it wasn't a Tiffany. It wasn't. There's no Tiffany. No no no. I think it was in Texas. I'll double check and add it to the listing. Oh, that's actually valuable. I think that adds because people in Texas yeah. they love stuff from Texas. It's like a very you know. And, um, and and it's on the receipt. It says that he bought both of those bracelets. Includes it has both bracelets. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other bracelet was fifteen dollars or something. So it's pretty funny. <laughs> how much? How much value? Did, how much was the price of it back then? How much was the price? It was uh, in the under three hundred dollars. Three hundred bucks. Yeah, but that was real yeah. money then, sir. It was like yeah, you it was know, like two hundred something. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 probably like the equivalent of four, five, six grand today, roughly. Yeah, seven yeah, grand. Yeah. not cheap. It was not, you know, people Rolex was never cheap. It was always like no. a month's salary, basically. Yeah, exactly. The average guy. Yep. And how much value, like this watch? Okay, so explain to me what's special. So this watch is, um, if it didn't have the box, like how much value do you think the box papers that whole story add the, that's that adds to the value? Typically, box and papers adds about twenty percent uh, to the value. So it's a, it's always a nice thing, even at a million dollar level, they could add two hundred thousand dollars having the box and papers. So, as a result, there's a lot of, if you will, fake or added boxes and papers that weren't original to the watch. People find old papers, fill them in, make fake papers, etc. Uh, so you have to be careful. You know, paying a premium for fake papers happens a lot, unfortunately. But this also has the unique element. I think there's two things which are interesting about the watch is that you have, um, you know, the guy had bought two bracelets. He got the Jubilee, yeah. right? And the Oyster. And yeah. I actually think, I actually, all kidding aside, I do think that the Texas thing does add value. It does have like a yeah. little, if you get that, spe like, guy, because it's a different, yeah. you know, it's not like a guy from, I don't know, Florida. Who cares about Florida, right? <laughs> Texas is like, you know, they're very into, you know, yeah. Like, yeah it's, that's the only uh, state where people really are very into their you know, a lot of pride. Their, yeah, hang on. A okay, okay. The next watch we're gonna pull up is uh, I'm gonna actually it's gonna be a little bit of a modern watch. Hang on, a little bit of a modern watch. Uh, hang on, here we go. We got the uh, the the Daytona eleven six five zero eight, the champagne dial, full gold. Yeah. Full yep. gold. Let's. Yeah. Uh, Let's pull yeah, it up. Right okay. There it is. Okay. Wow. I got to, it, it's so much different, you know, in the light, in the daylight than on, in pictures, really. It's like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's a gorgeous it really, one. Yeah. This, this is, it's wow. really. They discontinued this model last year, the 116508. They introduced the new model. Uh, which has a slightly different kind of case profile, more downturned lugs, a little different, but it's a very attractive, unpolished it's from 2023. Um, but the gold dial is kind of the least desirable, funnily enough. It's the hardest. Champagne? Sell. Yes. On champagne? Yeah. yeah, no, champagne is kind of, here's the thing, I think champagne, again, I got, you know, the, the tornograph. Is yeah. here's, here's, here's my feeling about champagne dials, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think generally champagne dolls, you want to go, because that's a vintage look, right? It's yeah. Champagne dolls should be like vintage, 70s, possibly 80s, you know, 60s, 70s. But yeah. here's the thing, I think, and I think on the day date, I hate champagne dolls on a day date. It's like a modern day date. It's like, or right, any, yeah, it's yeah. like, it's so cliched, you know, it's a victim yeah. of its own success. 
it's a victim yeah. of its own success. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. it's like the Submariner, the bluesy, or as I call it, the mm -hmm. King Tut. You know, it's like so popular or so, but it's like you got all the wrong people. That's born, a good you know? nickname. I've never heard that. That's awesome. Yeah, I came up with a King Tut because you know it was the Egyptian, the blue and gold. Wait, wait. You know. Yeah, that's awesome. Blue. This is the name I came up with. This is my contribution to horology. And I, so you you pass it around because you're you're much more influential than I am. I'm just a, you know yeah. a guy with a small chance. So you call the kink. It gives it. It's more regal now. The kink. Talk. I love it. I know. I love it. And people know what you're <laughs> to, actually, which is amazing. <laughs> it's awesome. The kink. The kink. Talk. So so here's the thing though. But I think that watch. What do you think the odds are that it's going to go to a female buyer? Because that looks like. The type of thing that, like, you know, uh, yeah. you know, so a woman would buy, like, because it, it's a it's such a powerful look. I think for a woman yep. to wear a Daytona, it's like a real power move. You know, it's like that. You know, my wife wears a Daytona with a white dial. Ah, all right, all right. What kind? What yeah. kind? Uh, it's the predecessor reference, the one one six five two zero in yellow with a white dial. It's great. Full um, gold. Full gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's Ooh, nice. Okay. You're on uh, Palm Beach, so it's the vibe, the Palm Beach vibe. Yeah, it's the vibe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's nice not to have to worry about setting a date. She used to have the day date, and I was always setting uh, the day of the week and the date. You know, if you set it down for a day or two, it's annoying. So uh, you 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 have kids, right? So your wife takes yeah. the kids to school. There's other moms there. You got that whole. So do they are they like envious of her watch? Do you get customers? Do you get customers because they see wow. They yeah, see, is she, is she like a <laughs> mom now? Yeah. yeah, for sure. It's a good thing. It's advertising on the wrist for the business. That's good. Um, it was funny. We had a friend, Sid Mashburn, say to her, who's got a clothing store, a number of clothing stores. He said, so you wear that watch every day? And she said, yes. And he said, wow, a Tuesday needs that watch. <laughs> That's pretty funny. No, here's the thing. I think, I, I think, you know, from a practical standpoint, it's interesting. I saw an interview you did. You said, you know, you're in Florida, you whatever, and you don't wear dress watches. You only wear a watch and a bracelet because, you know, you're always getting your hands wet or something, you know, whatever. You know? And I think for, like, uh, a woman, right, like a mom, right? Yeah, yeah. A, a Rolex, a 36, you know, steel, whatever, it's the most practical watch because, I mean, it really looks is. cool. It's like a brace. But it could take a beating. Like, you know, your kids vomit on it. They pee yeah. on it. Whatever it is, right? It's, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is. No problem. Go in, the yeah. Ocean. Yeah, go in the ocean, go in the pool, go in whatever. It's a great, great watch. But I think the problem with that is I think the problem with, or I don't know, for, for me, the problem with, with, with female buyers coming into the space for these 36 or 40 millimeter watches is all of a sudden it's increased demand by, you know, 30, 40, you know, that's pushed up that's prices, true. no? Yeah, yeah, that's sweet. It's true. Um, it's a good problem to have, though, more women. No, for you, yeah, yeah. If you own the watch already, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How much yeah. do you think, how much do you, I'm curious, how much, do you, when did you see this trend really start taking off of, like, women buying, like, Daytona, and how much do you think that's had a, an effect on prices, especially, like, two-tone or gold? Because two-tone is the way to go, usually, for yeah. women, no? Yeah. In the last five years, I think there's a lot more women in the watches than there were before then. Um, a whole wide spectrum, whether it's, like, vintage jewelry watches you know like very small dials and heads is and that different. i thought that was out of fashion the little the the the, the they call a grandma like the very fit i thought that was out of fashion I thought yeah. they all well, like big. not like that necessarily the hamilton ones or things like that but but like pateks and other things oh, those have really? those have those were very hard to sell like five to eight years ago and now there's a lot more people that think they're cool and they honestly if it's a really nice one sell very quickly too so a husband buying it for their wife or, uh, you know, a woman buying it for themselves, et cetera. So that, that whole kind of jewelry cocktail watch, if it's from a prestigious name, a Rolex, Patek, AP, et cetera, those go qu much quicker. They were almost unsellable and things you'd have to scrap like five to eight years ago. Okay. Interesting. I didn't know that. I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't paying attention yeah. to those like you know, cocktail watches, you know, with the yeah. diamonds, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. And they've made amazing ones. You know, Patek, AP, everybody made amazing yeah. watches in the 50s, 60s, like, you know, crazy jewel, you know, like, uh, unbelievable. Yeah. So we, got a, we got a super chat from a Chili Badger. Great That's to great. see Eric on board. He knows his onions. This, this is two pounds. It's not dollars. This is better. This is like That's $2.40. Thank you, Chili Badger. <laughs> we got 
We got one of your customers, John oh, Seltzer. Oh, John, that's sweet. That's so sweet. John is a great. I hope I can meet you in person one day. Two watches, 14060, a 99 GMT Coke. Best dealer. Best dealer. That's that's really On this sweet. channel, we only bring you the best. And and this is Thank this you. is not a guy we this is not a guy you paid, right? This guy, John, you didn't pay him no. to do this, right? He bought he paid He's me. Like, He's not doing <laughs> Oh my God! Uh, oh, this is interesting. Okay, so we got a comment here. Uh, I wear. Uh, I don't know if this is a woman. I guess I don't. Know. A thirty-one millimeter day just. So it's, I guess probably a woman, right? So uh, doesn't yeah. say. It. I don't see a picture. So okay. and finally, thirty-six millimeter too big. But interestingly, the Daytona suits me. Is that? Does that make sense, Eric? Thirty-six millimeter Rolex is too big, but a Daytona is a smaller size. Or maybe she likes it. I mean, it's a, it's a solid, like the way the bracelet. It's really like a piece of armor. The way that they do wear it differently. I I yeah. I actually it's yeah, it's different than like a day date. Um, my wife wore the day date well, but I like the date. She prefers the Daytona on her wrist. She like it's like a piece of armor almost. Finds it more comfortable you know, on the bracelet. You know, that's an interesting psychological thing because we were talking before you got on, we we're talking about the psychology of Rolex ads, which are like amazing. The ads. Yeah, They're, yeah. Rolex advertising with the copy. I'm not, you know, the stuff from the 60s, the 70s when they had sold your whole story. And you said something interesting. You used the word, it's like a piece of armor. And, you know, I think, yeah. you know, women like that security. They like yeah. something. And, and I, when they wear the watch, maybe they feel more, I don't know, secure. Something it's like a different feeling, right? It's confidence, yeah, it confidence, right? Yeah. Some yeah. sort of right. it's a different it's like a fact. Yeah, you know, everything is all about fashion, psychology. Okay, so we got this uh hang on a second. John Seltz is in Bangkok and New York. Well, interesting choice of cities. Bangkok and New York. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We That's got weird. uh vintage. Uh yes. Eric, why don't you change your name to Vintage? I name like it. Site. Yeah. <laughs> because it's 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 gonna be uh you know it's gonna be very interesting so yeah uh great humor yes we you know we like to have a little bit of fun eric by the way yeah, i like that you have this, you do have a sense of humor a, a lot of a lot of people in the space they're not you know they, well, i think you know, that's why you have a good following jack <laughs> <laughs> some jokes you know they go especially in california a lot of people in california I, I a lot of times they don't they don't understand like you got to explain that it's, I try not to make jokes. And it goes okay. Yeah. Now we're, we're going to bring up a very interesting watch. So this okay. So real quick, this this Daytona, right? Thirty nine five is the price. It's a, basically it's a new watch, full yeah. set, new yeah, watch. Yeah. Uh, it's, and thirty nine. What's, hang on, hang on. what's interesting? Yeah, what's interesting is I just sold the twenty twenty three John Mayer for about seventy five k, and. The identical watch. You're literally paying thirty five thousand dollars additional just for the green dial versus the gold dials. It's crazy. How's this price? I'm not familiar. How's the, how, is, how is your price? Let's say by comp. Somebody like how's your price compared? If somebody went on Chrono. Are you yeah. competitive? Yeah, well, I I'm modern. I try to be the cheapest. Um, but that watch was made for like a decade, so an older one would be like seven thousand dollars less, sort of thing. Uh, ten percent. But this one is Chris. This Chris been like the newest year, the last year of production. People like that. I, again, I think if it goes to a female bar, I think women usually want newer. They want newer. They don't. Yeah, want and that did go to. A, it was. Watch. Yeah, it was bought. It was bought by a husband for his wife as a gift. There so you go. go. <laughs> there you That's go. There you go. Okay. Uh, let's. Uh, let me, okay, so we're gonna bring up a really interesting Patek. Now we got a Patek, right? Hang on a second. Mm -hmm. Let me pull this up. This is very unusual. I didn't know. I did not know that this even existed. I had no idea that this existed. Uh, hang on a second. And then, and then you'll pull. Up, and then we'll go to a couple more questions. And here we go. Okay. Yeah. So we got. Uh, we got this. This is kind of like, I'm calling it the Patek Milgauss, right? It's yeah. anti-magnetic, yeah, yeah. stainless steel, which is rare. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's a very special watch. Let's, uh, yeah, let's see that in the in the daylight. Okay, okay. Can we see that bracelet? Like, what kind of bracelet is that? It's a Gay Frere bracelet. Uh, it was not original to the watch, but it is from the period. So it's it's just a really nice touch. You know, you can obviously wear this on a strap. It makes it a bit okay. more of a watch. Uh, it's removable. 
but it just looks great on a bracelet. It makes it more sporty. So that's sweet. And yeah, now, what do you think? How did it come originally? Did it originally, did it, do you think it came on a strap or bracelet? Most, what do you think was the most came on a strap, the vast majority. There's a few that came on bracelets, but okay. it's, uh, it was, it's really like one of the first Patek tool watches, if you will, for a specific purpose, which was for engineers, doctors, people working in fields with high magnetism. Um, and it's, this is an early example with an oversized seconds register, uh, which is cool. If you look, it's very large. The later ones, it's slightly smaller. Um, it's just so interesting with the super long hour markers, the Arabic 12 very kind of 50s sputnik feeling the space age but also just this very formal watch it's one of my favorites yeah I'm, I'm looking at it and it's like that 12 it's really so well balanced you got the 12 you is. get that sputnik. you know the more i look and the whole thing is just really i i hate to use that word but it's very clean it's a very clean yeah. dial yeah, uh, it is. can you hold it up again? I want to see how thick it is. Like, how thick is that? Is that thicker than a normal? Because usually they have that, like, it's, what do you call it? It's fat, just a, what do you call that cage? The, the yeah, cage. Yeah, it has. <laughs> the, it's designed with that cover of the movement. It's really special. Um, it's not too thick, you know. Particularly compared to modern tastes, no one would bat an eye. But it's not ultra thin. That's for sure. Compared to some. Cool. Who, who buys that type of watch? I'm curious, like, because you've sold some, like, because this is, it's like an unusual watch, right? It's not, this is yeah. not a flash watch. You don't wear this to flex in South Beach, right? You're not wearing it to, yeah, clubs, yeah. you know, it's like, this is, who buy, who's a typical buyer for Patek, you know, oddball steel, like that type of watch? Who buys that? Uh, the first kind of category of people that are interested in these are people who actually work in fields of high magnetism. So uh, doctors, like it because it was kind of marketed toward doctors back in the day and they think that's kind of part of their heritage uh some engineers i know have purchased these and then just some people who maybe aren't a big patek collector but they they just feel it's an important reference and they like the look so maybe most of their watches are chronographs like daytonas and Carreras and things like that but if there was one patek time only they were going to have it might be this watch so I, I've sold a few over the years. They're not common, um, but they're really, really special. Okay. So I mean, I mean, look, the price is is it ref, I guess it reflects you know historical importance. Or rarity. eighty nine grand. That's like a you know that's real money, right? For a protect, for is. steel yeah. protect, it's steel gold. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's crazy. Interesting. Uh, we got uh, we got a couple of comments here. Charlie Dunn says, "Thank you for the fifty five twelve, Eric." Charlie works for me. He's uh, my vice oh. president. <laughs> so, this thing is a, a plant. That, that's that's a plant. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get off there, Charlie. Get back to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we got uh, AD Never Calling says we all know how nasty and tricky vintage can be. Wind vintage eliminates all concerns as he's above board. <laughs> the, most in the world of watches. So period. Sweet. I don't know who this guy is, but you can call me and I'll call you back. Even though the AD doesn't call you, I'll call you. So thank you for the kind words. He's, uh, I think he buys my, I think he's, I've seen him on track. He's, I think he got this, uh, spr uh, what do you call it? What's the Let's thing? The that's Sprite. The, the, the Sprite. Vintage Sprite. Yeah. Yeah. The Sprite, all of a sudden, you know, uh, it's, it's, no, it's very interesting. Uh, let's get a couple questions here. Uh, okay, so Daytona. Okay, we talked about Daytona. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Iona? I, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, uh, eleven six five one nine. She's a customer. If you have one, that's cool. That's a white gold uh, on strap Daytona. So it's cool. Yeah, on a strap. Does that come yeah. with the? That's the one with the ro with the Rolex but uh, the Rolex buckle. That's the one with the yeah, Rolex. Yeah, but, but on typically like a brown alligator strap. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, very interesting. Okay, so so this Patek uh, now how. What's the market phase? I'm curious. Like the, you've been selling, you've sold these. Uh, hang on, is this? Wait, you there, Eric? Yeah. Okay. They're cut out for yes. a second. Yeah, the internet one. Okay, so you've handled a couple of these over the years, of, yes. the, of like the anti-magnetic. How I'm curious, like how is the market? Because this is one of these watches that I would say it's like, it's in that 
collectible category, like leg yeah. it's a historic. How have prices on that watch moved? Maybe since the first time you saw one. Let's say over the last, I don't know, maybe when was the first time you saw? How have prices changed for that watch? Yeah, it's interesting because like a, a decade ago, they were not really that well understood or appreciated. So they were kind of in the twenty thousand dollar range, and then suddenly. Wow. A lot of people came into Patek like around 2015, 16, and they went to like 40 to 50. They were just very hard to find. They were all gobbled up. And then it, shortly thereafter, there was one that was signed by Bayer at Bonhams around that time frame that went for 110 and people's you know heads exploded. They're like 110. Okay. And then after that, they went as high as 150, 160. They come much. down... Yes, yeah. Or if vintage, was, vintage, vin like weird vintage stuff went through this. Because this, this is weird. This watch is weird. Yeah. You know, it's in that weird, it's weird. Yeah, if it was, there's a few different series. The very earliest examples from 58 <clears> had a hard enamel printing for Patek Philippe Genev. This is printed, so it's kind of painted on the dial. The earlier ones had it pressed into the dial and then filled with hard enamel. So those have a slight premium, and if it was unpolished, it could but, be a 150k but, watch if it was that variant. Um, so these that, weren't that high. This type of weird weirdo stuff went to 150. Yeah, from yeah. This this one would have never been that high because it's the the second version of the first series, but it's still really special. Okay. Obviously. Okay. Yeah. Speak, speaking of auctions, let me ask you this now. You know, without mentioning any, you know, you know, we see a lot of times people have. Um, you know they have, uh, you know they have. Let's let's just say they have an interest in a certain market, right? They have a certain, in, yeah. they have a large inventory of a specific watch, where they start building a position, or maybe it's a brand like, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, and, and and they see something come up at auction. Like I'm seeing things with Gerald Genta, right? Gerald Genta. Yeah. Now, how yeah. how 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 regularly do either dealers try to pump up like that watch? Let's say somebody had four of those in inventory. Would they bid up the watch to make people go? Because people notice. It's a small yeah. world, and they see like that yeah. watch go crazy. How often do you see that type of thing happening, and is that happening now in certain models? It happens. Um, historically, it's happened where people kind of hoard a certain model, and then they bid it up at auction, which, by the way, is not illegal. You could say it's no, unethical, it's really uh, but you can do whatever you want. You can shill bid at auction. The auction house itself can't, but, you know, a brand could bid against Legi themselves. Legi I would just say legitimate auctions houses yeah. technically can't. <laughs> well, they're they're not. Yeah, exactly. They're not supposed to like that illegally bid people up. But you could bid on your own item just to get a high result and still pay the auction house, and you're just out the buyer's premium because you get the watch back. So, uh, very subject to manipulation. There's a lot of people that try to hype up brands because they have a vested interest in it or the brand itself is trying to do that. I mean, it's kind of happening with Daniel Roth, which had a resurgence and certain people owned a number of Roths and were really trying to push values there and tell the story. Um, who's, who's pushing up Daniel Roth without mentioning any names? Who's pushing well, up Daniel Roth? LVMH themselves owns and restarted the brand. So they're, they've been kind of pushing Daniel Roth. They own How Gerald Zinta as well. Okay, so, so we see the they bought Gerald Genta as well, and they're restarting it. So of course they're trying to hype it and hype the vintage models and all that. And we're seeing this now. We're we are we seeing this happening with Universal Genève, or are you? What do you think of Universal Genève, by the way? Like, what, what's your take on that? I like Universal Genève a lot. It's a very uh, obviously niche thing. It's like if you know what Universal Genève is, you're probably a pretty serious watch person. Um, the brand just sold the Breitling for $69 million from a Hong Kong kind of business conglomerate trading company that had it, I believe, over 20 years. So uh, Breitling is now in the process of restarting the company. I serve on the advisory panel for Breitling for the Universal oh. Genève brand. Um, well, I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, so we have a, we, do we have a conflict of interest? So you have to oh, disclose this. You have to disclose. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I disclosed it right now. So oh, I appreciate you know, that. They, I had no idea. Okay. Yeah, That's they're cool. Taking, yeah, it's very exciting. It was cool when they contacted me and were 
getting close to finalizing the purchase and being part of the brainstorming about models to focus on and lines and opportunities wow. in the scheme of their company. Obviously, it's great for them because they already have the infrastructure for making watches, the marketing teams, et cetera. So they can they don't need to start from the ground up. They can use their existing personnel and machines and everything else and watchmakers to make universal. Um, so it's very smart in that that way. Wow, I, well, I actually I, I had no idea. So wait, so so Universal Genève, oh, Bright, Breitling contacted you, yeah. And what, what and what did they say? They what, they just picked up a phone yeah. or how they? Yeah, they said uh, we want to sign this NDA. We're about to buy something, and you want to be involved. And I said sure. So it's cool. Did you have a relationship? Did you know anybody at Breitling before? Or was it was just out of the blue. No, I, I've had a good relationship with Breitling. They, since the new ownership with George Kern, kind of came over from Richemont. Fred Mandelbaum is kind of their leading vintage historian slash expert. He's a collector and uh, he's based in Austria, in Vienna. And he's not even full time with them or anything, but he's just kind of their vintage guy. And Fred's invited me to do some things with Breitling. It's been great. Okay, so basically, and how, who who else is on this advisory board that they have for? I mean, basically, they reached out to vintage guys. Like, how many people? Do yeah. you know, like, who else? Do you know, or who's on? Yeah, it? there's a few. There's a few collectors um, that are very kind of well known in terms of Universal Genève collecting, and that's pretty much it. It's mostly collectors. Okay, no, so that's that's very interesting. So they're going to be taking this serious. I mean, they have. You know they have you know obviously they have an investment yeah. in this what's um uh, and when is the first one going to come out when is the first new breitling ug going to come out uh it's going to be a couple of years i think they're not going to put anything like breitling on it it'll just be universal genève as yeah. standalone standalone so brand but yeah now that's a it's, it, i would say it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, hard, a heavy lift in a way because that brand is really known amongst only like you know the cognoscenti, you know, like yeah. vintage people. So yeah. That name, the thing, I'll tell you what I, I'll give as a marketing thing, right? Where I was talking yesterday, yeah. we had somebody on a live stream talking about brand names. These names are very important psychologically, right? And, I, and he was asking about IWC International Watch. And I said, you know what? Yeah. My problem with IWCs, it means nothing. It's like one of these conglomerate names from the 60s, yeah. you know, you know, it could be, it means nothing. And he, I think Universal Genève suffered from that problem because that name means doesn't mean anything. <coughs> you know, Rolex, Rolex has some sort of like magical quality. You know, yes. Audemars Piguet, it's a name. You know, they're names. Patek, those are all these are all names. Yeah. But when exactly. you go into when you go into like Universal, like you know, con conglomerate, uh, you know, combined industries, whatever. Yeah, what yeah. It means. So, but it's a tough. I mean, you know, they have to build. Yeah, it's gonna be. In yeah, it's going to be a lot of effort over the coming years, you know. And the people who love vintage UG, they might buy some, but you can't. They can't be your core audience either because no. they're they're already into the vintage models. They're, so how you've got to find no? Them. You know, it's interesting. I was looking back. I think it was September. August, I was kind of. I got interested. I was always. A, I was looking for tri compacts. I went on Corona. Yeah. I was looking. I think I even reached out to you and. I couldn't find a, a good one. Like I was, I, I wanted like one from the 50s, 60s. I don't like 50s, 60s. There was a, there was about 14 of them. If I remember, I wanted one in gold. Yeah, you know, not you know, and and uh, they were all they all had condition issues. They all had some yeah. dial stuff going on, and yeah. I couldn't. See, and all of a sudden, I went. I don't see any. They, and pr how much of prices increased since the Breitling announcement? Uh, significantly. It's not even necessarily just prices, but the interest went way up. So things that were sitting there, like we had a tropical pull router on our site. It was not spectacular condition, but it was not expensive, under $4,000. And it was sitting there for like a year. The announcement is made. And then the next week we have like three inquiries and it sells. So uh, it was, yeah, it, it's really generated a lot of interest. A lot of people looking for... Tri-compaxes, uh, things like that. 
is this do you think that's a do you think that's a temporary thing or is this going to be here for a while this type of you know this interest in ug is that going to die down a little bit over you think over maybe the next couple of months and or was there maybe like a, that initial rush you know that speculative rush initially yeah i mean i think we're a couple by the way i was just going to show you this was one of the watches i had selected for, for okay. us to talk about and it's the uh, it's a vintage nina rent which is you know similar to a Daytona Valjoux seventy two okay. as well. Um, I don't know. I don't know. This it's a UG. That's a UG. Yeah. Yeah. UG. Yep. Just a beautiful watch. Nina Rent was the wife of uh, the Formula One driver Jakin Rent. Um, okay. So, but yeah, this is you know very desirable. A lot less expensive than a vintage Daytona. You know, but just an. You awesome have that watch. on your site. That's that's available right now. Uh, we're putting it up today. Uh, I think oh, it's up there. Okay, now. give us a first dibs. First dibs. How much? Yeah, how much? Uh, Fourteen thousand nine hundred just serviced. Uh, it's you know still sort of worn, but the case is unpolished. Um, okay, okay. It's very Daytona Speedmaster esque. Um, yeah, it's a cool watch. But um, yeah, so uh, about this is you know a model that they should definitely consider bringing back just like oh we got a question we got we got a uh, baron red is it eric do you have input on the initial ug releases are you giving them input are you, did you give them a list of hey, yes. here's you got yeah yeah we have input we they kind of have their vision we've given our feedback you know everyone is concerned that brightling's going to make watches that are too big too thick for ug that they're gonna put date windows everywhere, like you know, like the Breitling for Bentley line back in the day, which has just long been discontinued. But people are fearful of like the fifty millimeter chronographs that are not ironically fifty millimeters are not like designed for bomber pilots to wear over their flight jackets. Uh, so um, that's the big fear people always have when they hear about UG. Oh, Wait now, let me see, Eric. That watch, this the, the Nina Rin, right now. That watch, how much? What was the price? Let's say, you know, in in, in September, that watch. What was that going for in September? A watch like um, that. It's honestly that I haven't priced it necessarily any different. It's just the speed okay. at which it. I expect it to sell. Oh, so okay. it hasn't really gone up, <clears throat> but stuff was just sitting before, and now there's mm -hmm. a lot of interest. So I can't. Okay. I couldn't qualitatively say they've gone up. 10 or 20 how do you feel about cartier what do you think of the cartier thing do you think that's like overhyped did it get a little ahead of itself the whole cartier thing there's a lot of herd uh herd um kind of behavior not just herd immunity but herd behavior with watch collecting <laughs> so uh you know everyone decides the <laughs> the next hot thing uh and then everyone said oh i guess i should get that because it's going up but the reality is, I think a lot of people are buying vintage Cartiers that don't even want to wear it. They just want to, they want the street cred and other people to give them props on Instagram and stuff. <laughs> but um, they're cool watches. It's not really something I aspire to wear every day. They're not really great from a watchmaking perspective. The movements are pretty junky generally. Uh, the cases are as porous as a paper towel if you go outside like they're they're just not like a rolex oyster case or anything like that um there's something you you want to put on your ascot and like go to the movies in the 1930s wearing when but it's not it's, raining when it's not raining exactly. it can't be raining otherwise it's shot <laughs> so uh but i i think they're cool uh but it's obviously a little bit of the latest flavor of the month. Yeah. Um, what um, What do you think about <clears throat> what What about Ebel? You know, there's a big push. I was at the Miami Beach show. I noticed a lot of guys, the Italians. Yeah. They were, were spooking the Ebels. That whole showcase of Ebels, and and that's an I don't know. Is that a? I think of it as an '80s watch. Is it an '80s watch or like what is it? Is it a, is oh, it a watch? It's, it's like it's what? Miami Vice, yeah, Miami Vice, nineteen okay. eighties. Don Johnson driving his. He famously he traded his. He he. I think it was he was upgraded from the from the day date from Rolex day date to the <laughs> Ebel chronograph in the like a later because that would became the hot thing. Yeah, and I mean the Ebel. They typically had Zenith El Primero movements that kind of helped revitalize the brand after they after the El Primero movements and. 
machines had been hidden in the attic by Charles Vermont when Zenith Electronics bought Zenith Watch Company. This guy who was a watchmaker there, the, the story goes, was ordered to destroy all the equipment that made the El Primero watches, which cost like tens of millions of dollars to develop the El Primero movement when it came out in 1969. And he basically was the short guy and was pissed. And he like spent every night moving all the stuff into the attic of the Zenith watch factory, all the machines, and parts and everything. And then his bosses were like, good job. Thank you for destroying all that. <laughs> and then Zenith Electronics basically bought the trademark because they were pissed people would, you know, they had they were the main TV company back in the seventies. And I remember I had I think I had I had a Zenith, you know, my family. Zenith, yeah, Zenith. So yeah, Zenith. Zenith I guess. Zenith. Zenith. Why do we call Zenith? Zenith? Yeah. Zenith. So the Swiss, the watch company, they say Zenith, but the Americans said Zenith TVs. So they bought the watch company just to shut it down. They brought all the El Primero watches back and they put them on a table in the headquarters in New Jersey. I bought four of them that one guy walked in and brought four cover girls, uh, one each for himself and his two sons and then one spare. I bought all four after he passed away from one son. I still ha kept the new old stock one and wear it occasionally, but... Um, then a few years later, Zenith TVs wasn't doing as well, and they had competition, I don't know, from Panasonic and others. And they basically sold the watch company after owning it for like five years, I think. And all these companies went to Zenith Watch Company and said, can, you, can we get the El Primero? Because the Swiss watch industry had kind of survived the quartz crisis. So Is that this guy's name? Charles, Charles Vermont. Vermont. Yeah, exactly. Vermont? That, yeah, Vermont, the Americans say Vermont. And uh, the basically, Charles said, Oh, yeah, we kept all that stuff basically in the attic. <laughs> and they're like, Oh, thank God, we have all this stuff that costs like tens of millions of dollars and we didn't destroy it. And they brought it out and they started doing movements for Ebel. Then Rolex came calling a few years later and said, You know, we've studied all the chronograph movements automatic because they were still making manual wine Daytonas like this. And uh, they basically said, well, we would like to use that and modify it, make it a little lower beat, the 28,800 beats per okay. hour instead of 36,000. That's the history. We got some audience, Eric, we got some audience questions. I hope you have some time because I want to show three of your watches. So we got sure. a couple of questions. We got we got the, the audience. Now, we, I want to bring back the, the, the Patek, uh, uh, the anti-magnetic. I call it the Patek Milgauss. Yeah, you know, we yeah. have a super chat from Patel Philippe. You know, the Patel Philippe is actually somebody told me that was actually the real name of the company. It was actually called Patel Philippe. It was actually an Indian guy, Patel Philippe, and then they changed it to make it yeah. more like more or something. But this is the well, real guy. This is the, grandson. this is the grandson of the founder, Patel Philippe, who is the yeah. founder. So he's yeah, asking, yeah. Uh, nice panel. Eric, thoughts on, well, actually, first of all, uh, uh, Duke fully now. If you have you seen this, by the way, we got the anti-magnetic. Uh, I don't know if you're just joining us, but we got the anti-magnetic, the Milgauss, the Patek Milgauss, eighty-nine grand. Uh, now we got a question here. He's asking, uh, "Are you are you a Patek guy?" By the way, Eric, are you into Patek? I like Patek, of course. Like Patek. He's got questions. Uh, Eric, thoughts on Crown Guard Pateks? Crown Guard Pateks. Will this era ever be loved? 5110, 5107, 5127. I'm not a huge fan of the Crown Guard Pateks, to be honest. It's, uh, I think Rolex does a better Crown Guard with their sport watches back in the day, like uh, Charlie Dunn's 5512. The, the, you know, wearing a world time with a Crown Guard, I guess it's like, you could be hard on it, but like, what are you going to hit with the Crown? I mean, Crown Guards were designed to protect the Crown from being hit on like, the edge of a door or something like that so that the crown wouldn't break and the stem break so you couldn't set the watch uh, because of that impact. So um, I just, they, they're so thin the way they go around the crown. I just don't love the shape personally. Uh, and I find it a little bit of a weird kind of cyborg look with <laughs> like the sport crown guard 
and I think you know I have, a, I have a travel time you know the protect travel time it's got yeah. the crown guards and it's it's yeah. kind of like a collar truck to me it looks very modern it gives it like a more modern look you know so like yeah. I was like you know I, for that watch I like it for the other ones I'm kind yeah, of yeah. like you know because because you know what is the crown guard is matched by the pushers on the other side so you're kind of you're matched yeah. a little bit yeah 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 that's true that's, that's I mean that's what it is it makes it sportier for sure so it does yeah yeah insane. uh john john from bangkok asking is the 666 a good invest investment what is it six, what is that the that's a triple six c dweller um and oh, it's a kind of transitional watch one six 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 zero that's why they call it the triple six um okay i i think it's probably not from an investment perspective not going to increase that much there was some hype around those and the matte dial ones at some point we're going for like almost 30k for for that watch but i would rather have the predecessor the 1665 like a great white with the domed crystal versus the flat crystal the sapphire crystal of the triple six and i certainly wouldn't pay like 2x for the triple six versus the 1665 i thought that was silly the triple six came down a lot and it's more like maybe 15 16k for the matte dial variant or less um but the matte dial 16 800s and triple sixes don't really get me excited i'd rather have the predecessor version with acrylic crystals let's i want to get more to like market talk because yeah we have a lot of people you know who are interested in you know I hate to say yeah. it, you know, the, the investment potential. Not that it's an investment, but it is. Okay, so uh, we got uh, Duke Fully. By the way, you know, Eric, I don't know if we have the members of our channel, they're real aristocrats. So if they see that little sign, yeah. means they're a baron. They're a baron. And anybody can become a baron. Anybody can become an aristocrat for only $4.95. $4.95. They click the Join Now button. They become an aristocrat. And that is right. Duke Fully. Uh, Eric, <clears throat> he's $10 Super Chat. Eric, what's coming down, I guess, down in price, that's grail level vintage, grail level. Double red, si single red, uh, 1680 Mark One, radium dial subbies, mill subs. What's the good buy in grail vintage Rolex? Um, double reds have come down a lot uh, for some reason. And that used to be the grail, like, when I got into this like 15 years ago, it was everyone wanted the double red. Um, they like the thicker case. That was an era of Panerai. Panerai collectors were like, if I'm going to buy a vintage Rolex, it's going to be a double red, etc." So that those have, I mean, some of these have gone down like 50%. So um, that's a good buy. If you find a great quality example, um, you know, obviously most are polished. There's a lot with dial chips. They were very sensitive to the dials, the edges having degradation, et cetera, uh, for dial that era chips. in the 70s. Yeah, so that uh, basically yeah. that the sides of the edges of the dial would chip. Um, I, I want to ask you a question. Uh, would you buy, you know, Patek, Patek Philippe collectors, you know, they're, they're very picky. It's almost like Porsche buyers. You know, they're very, yeah. you know, they want to have a full set, box, papers, everything. Yeah. What do you think, you know, recently we had, we know of somebody, we're not going to mention names, but who bought a Patek travel time, you know, naked, naked, no box, no papers, and it had a chip on the crystal, possibly oh. from like a machine attack in London. I don't know. Would you buy, would you buy a naked Patek? What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? You got to be careful, obviously. Mo if we're it's a modern one. We're talking modern. We're talking about modern. Yeah. We're talking about yeah, something yeah. Yeah. Last 15, that, I mean that specifically, yeah. not, not. Yeah, yeah. 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 For for modern, it's it's kind of very hard to sell modern watches without boxes and papers. Even Rolex, people just expect it, so you have to almost like have a discount of fifty percent if it doesn't have the box and papers versus you know the typical twenty to twenty five percent if it does versus it does not. Like you're gonna get a thousand questions. Like I put up a Starbucks recently that was fully authentic Rolex but the owner had lost the box and papers at some point and it was a thousand questions of why doesn't it have box and papers why doesn't it have box it's like the guy lost it like i don't know what to tell you <laughs> things happen but uh it's fully authentic we've opened it we've examined it closely our watchmakers rolex train has like 
you know, it's just super annoying. So I don't, I don't even want to touch that stuff typically. But that's only one. So basically, what's the cutoff point where you got to have the box papers? Is it like 2010 or what's kind the of, cutoff? It's kind of like 20 in the last 20 years. If it doesn't, people 20. start asking questions. Millennium, yeah. yeah. Yeah, millennium. So it's yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I actually because I'm looking at a Patek. Um, it's funny we're talking about the rain, but yeah, like we're talking about the rain. Somebody like yeah, I was living in Miami for like you know or you know what Aventura you know for two years. <laughs> And you know, yeah. I, I never wear watches on a strap, like you know, Patek's, because like I don't know if it's gonna rain. I might be, you know, and it rains it, like randomly. It's yeah. random. It's just yeah. you know, I don't get stuck, and all of a sudden I'm drenched, and the watch, you know, is is ruined. Uh, mm -hmm. Wait, speaking of, okay, back to uh, Patel's question here on vintage, um, uh, big uh, grail. You know, a, what's happening with the turnograph? Is there gonna be? I, I'm saying, I'm telling everybody, there's gonna be a massive move in turnograph, and the turnograph mm -hmm. is. I He's think you've, go been, you've been pumping it because I've been getting like a couple questions a week. When is your next turnograph? Sixteen twenty-five, like steel, gold. No, seriously, seriously. I'm serious. Oh, really? we're, yeah, we're actually getting a lot of questions. I'm like, they're very hard to find. You know, they're not. I'm easy. curious. When did those questions all of a sudden start increasing? Like, when did you notice all of a sudden everybody's asking the turnographs? Uh, the last two months. <laughs> oh no, you're okay. kidding, right? You're you're no, not kidding, I'm not right? kidding. This is an April first. I'm not joking. We're getting wow, a lot more. I, I've been it's because funny. you know we got a bunch of videos. I'm I'm basically saying the turnograph is you know I'm you know I'm promoting the turnograph. I'm saying this it's is going to really, be the move. It's a cool watch because it's a sport kind of watch, but it's 36 and it's got that you know that sport vibe. But like the 36 millimeter Explorer is if it's an unpolished watch is in the 20s that you know a thousand dollars plus range so a turnograph in comparison is extremely cheap I, that's what you know again I'm, I'm like a markets guy i look at it as like you know there's a real value disparity it's got an arbitrage opportunity right the yeah. turnograph turnograph is a historically important watch you know it was worn by the thunderbirds right yeah. and uh the, you know, the, the 1625s the, so it's not like you can frankenstein it because it's got to have that reference number between the lugs so it's, you know, I think it's, the, is it the only real military watch Rolex? Because I, I mean, for the U.S. at least, it's, yeah. I think it's the only real watch, right? The Air Force they, got Yeah, that yeah. corresponds with, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's great. Uh, yeah, because I've been telling uh, people, that, yeah, this is like, uh, I, I said that, you know, this is the watch I got, you know, because I was awarded this from, the, you know, when I was in the Air Force uh, in Vietnam, I shot down like 20 or 30 MiGs over the Gulf of Tonkin. <laughs> that's awesome. This, this watch as you know as as a thing uh no it's, yeah. it's what, what do you think what's your take what, what do you think prices are going to go for turnographs let's say the two tones or, or even the golds i don't see that many of the full gold i don't see that many no, of these but like what do you what's your take on prices over the next three years forecast again we're not giving investment advice this is not you know but what's your take what's your i opinion? couldn't see these generally going up like 20 percent over the next two years but again it's for top condition all original ideally unpolished really nice bracelets if you're looking at a steel or a two-tone um nice nice watches uh we got i think we got another question here uh let's see do we have another question okay up to tell philippe gifting five so duke philippe he's he's elevating the peasants into the aristocracy he's literally That's lifting great. up the unwashed masses into the level of aristocracy. They're all becoming barons, and so uh, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, yeah, this is we got, we have real serious people here. Okay, we got oh interesting question. Uh, a Mick in Florida, Baron, Baron Mick in Florida. If you have not already discussed this, oh, I have this question actually. Okay, Patek thirty nine forty versus fifty one forty. The thirty nine, yeah. 3940 is one of the most asked about watches we sell. Uh, it's complicated. It's perpetual micro rotor, very beautiful dress watch, um, very thin because of the micro rotor 240Q movement. Um, I, I love the watch. I always am hunting for them. They always sell quickly. We had a 5140 Rose re recently, you know, a, 3940 rows might be close to seventy thousand dollars or a bit more depending on condition full set etc could be more um 5140 we had one 
that was rose mint unpolished full set for 49 and it was pretty hard to sell it sat for months and months so you're talking like 20 to 30k less even though it's the newer reference and bigger which is kind of interesting um and kind of less common i think they were less made so you can make the the case that the 5140 is the better buy if you will because it's larger fewer exist newer uh, but people really like the aesthetics of the 3940, uh, and it is smaller for people who like smaller watches. Uh, it just depends what you like. Let me ask you this, because I have a um, 3940G, right? Like a 2006 or so, roughly? Yeah. Uh, the last, last, you know, last, what do you call it? Last, um, final, last series. final series. Yeah, full yeah. set, full set. You know, no machete awesome. chips. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, here's the thing, right? Now, that watch, right, I actually was thinking, tell me, would you would you do this? What would you advise? I actually was thinking of trading it for a 5140P, the blue dial. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking of doing – it might be – the values are roughly – I don't know. What's, what's your take? Is that a dumb thing to do, would you say? I prefer the size of the 3940 for me personally because it is more of an elegant, formal watch, um, and I like – it's a little more elegant and smaller. Um, I think the 5140 is cool because of the blue dial. Obviously, there's no 3940s with blue dials, but um, or they did some actually that were like a special salon only thing, but um, not standard production. So I think uh, my advice is probably to keep the 3940 because there's just a lot of momentum with that reference. It seems to be going up um but you get what you like you know if you much prefer yeah, 50, yeah. 40. so the one complaint that older people have with the 3940 is it's hard to read the time <laughs> uh, so make sure you can read it eric, eric the problem is by the time you know like look i'm you know by the time i was able to afford the watch all of a sudden you know i, I gotta I want to go to a yeah. restaurant at night i gotta take out the phone i gotta use a lot like yeah it's hard. To, it's yeah. It's a lot of people iron. have trouble reading it, honestly. So that is, I guess. Look, bottom. The takeaway is, uh, anybody watching this, uh, now is the time. Whatever you you like, buy it now. You make the, it's. It's gotta hurt. Sometimes you know, for a good watch, it's gotta hurt, right? It's gotta hurt. Like it takes that. a little more, and you gotta buy that. You never know. You never know. You don't want to be an eighty-year-old guy buying your Grail. I mean, then you're at the end of life, right? You want to yeah, enjoy now. Yeah, exactly. um, Let's, you want to pull up? Uh, you got you got some time. You got some time. We got some great questions here coming. You have you have a little we've more got time. About, uh, yeah, we've got about ten more minutes. Yeah, I've got about ten minutes. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, we have to have. Okay, let's let's pull up three more. Like you you picked three watches, right? You picked yeah, three yeah, yeah. watches. Show us what you have. Okay, I've got I've got two more because the Nina Rent was one of the three. Oh, okay, um, okay. But uh, this is an early. Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, it's an A-series, so one of the first. This was actually in the first 100 made um, back in 1972. Wow. Wait, so wait, just, wait. This is literally the first 100 that came the, the first, assembly line. Yeah, it's in the first 100 that were made. It's a really kind of obviously historically important. It created the whole category of steel sports watches that are elegant. Look at how thin this is. I mean, it's... Very, very easy to wear. Can you roll the bracelet. I want to see. I want to see the play in the light. Like, in the does it have the same as the modern ones? Yeah, it's got. Yeah, it's very similar. Uh, What's that dial? Yeah, uh, it's a beautiful that tapestry grayish blue dial. Mm. Awesome. So, what was uh, the original color? Was it gray? The original color for that watch was it gray yeah. dial? The yeah, yeah, it's like that grayish oh, right. blue. Uh, you just said, yeah, hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the date, it uh, was the thinnest automatic watch with a full rotor at the time. Uh, so it's just phenomenally thin. Um, really awesome watch on the wrist. But um, How, Oh, that, what's a small size, actually? That, that's, that could fit me. That's actually yeah, small. It, yeah, 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 it could. Um, now, but the, it's, it's a big watch, right? It's like a big, what's the size of it? It's like it's a 49 millimeters. Size. They call it the jumbo. Um, but it wears... It wears does it, well. Does, does it wear like the modern 39 or smaller? Maybe a touch smaller. Just okay, to, okay. I can't wear a modern 39 from, yeah. from AP. Let me see. Yeah. 
Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, how much? Uh, this, because it's in the first 100, is uh, 195,000. It's just, you can't really find them, as you can imagine. Yeah. It's like, no, you don't have to make excuses, Eric. You don't need to make yeah. excuses here. People are <laughs> big boys. Okay. So, 195, 195 grand for that watch. And uh, anybody that calls and says that they saw you on the watch report show, you give them the, the, the case. You give them one of the uh, wind vintage. Wind give them. Oh, where yeah. do you get these? These are top quality. Your, the things they're, that you give, these are top yeah, quality. They're, they're made by Jean-Paul Menacucci, who's in Italy. He makes wonderful Italian kind of leather straps and accessories. Um, Really excellent. It's beautifully made because I, I like I buy like straps from like you know Jean Rousseau, Camille Fournay. Like I, I love them. I'm a quality. This is like top quality. Yeah, and you you not and like some guys they give you they give you a pouch or some sort of thing, nylon and bullshit. You know, this is like okay. So that watch, this is I think the Shah of Iran was one of the first buyers, right? Pahlavi, he, Reza Pahlavi. He might have yeah, he might have had number one. Number two just sold at auction. Uh for over a million dollars in 2022 so it was pretty crazy at auction wow okay let me ask you at, at okay so at auction you know that like that watch in that you yeah. know more or less similar condition what are the comps at auction for that watch are you like in like where are you there's, how's your price there? there's no comps but in terms of recent market except that one that was uh that was one over a million dollars so it's uh you know, it's a good comp. Yeah, it's a good comp. And like uh, later ones are still, they're just slightly less expensive, but not that much less expensive. So, you know, you're paying a little bit of a premium for the number, but nothing crazy. Okay. Okay. Wow. Wow. No, this is, this is really interesting. You know, it's interesting. Eric, you know, the Shah of Iran was a Pahlavi. He was, this guy was like a real kind of vision. Like he, he had great style. Like, you know, he was the first guy for, you know, the, the, the Royal Oak. He was buying like, he was collecting like Andy Warhol in the seventies. Like, we'll call, he was the guy yeah. that ordered G wagon, the Mercedes G wagon. You know yeah. that? Yeah, he, <laughs> he was, was the guy uh, that basically commissioned it was, for the for the yeah, army. He a, yeah, he was a shareholder in Mercedes, and then he ordered twenty thousand of them for the Iranian army. And uh, he also had an AP Cobra. I think he had an early Nautilus. Uh, yeah, pretty awesome. How do we do a full screen? I don't know. How do we do a full can you Eric, can you pull up the AP again? The AP I want to see if we can get a full screen. Is it on your website? Is that even I don't see that on your yeah, website. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, look look on the site. You'll see it right okay. there. Out of Mars. No, I don't want to see this. Uh no, I don't know how to do this. Okay, we'll just bring it up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh pull, pull it up pull it up again. Give it give the punters one last look. Okay, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Uh yeah. Okay, what do you have? You're gonna have you have something that tops that? I mean, <laughs> you got the Nina Rind, you got the AP. Yeah, uh, no, I don't. Uh, okay, I've got. I actually, I have two other watches here. Uh, this, in terms of topping it, is really cool. It's a uh, um, James Bond Submariner, but look at the size of that crown eight millimeters, reference 5510. Um, this was uh, used by someone in the military. Super cool, and got a. How do you know? Great, how do you know it was it was a military use? What does it say? Does that like an engraved? Like, uh, it the, had uh, his. Uh, it had his uh, military number. He scratched. It was almost like a dog tag or an ID tag. So he engraved it <laughs> on the lug. It's just so cool. Um, oh, so this is okay. So this is interesting. Okay, this is what this is from the sixties. Uh, late fifties. Sean Connery wore a similar model okay. um that's why it got the nickname the james bond submariner it was the first submariner that was good to 200 meters and they did that partially with that big crown um so these are also called big crowns just a really special watch it's got a red triangle at 12 o'clock it's one of the distinctive features just a super cool special piece can you show us that the 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 uh his uh, id number show us the side the case the side where he's yeah. carved it that's yeah, kind of right interesting. Well, you know, I've never seen that. Uh, it's hard to see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. but that's interesting because you know these guys basically. So it's, maybe he probably got it like in Vietnam because I think the guys in Vietnam they basically would like. I think they wore dog tags. They would take them. Yeah. Off. They wore them boots yeah. on two boots in case you got blown up. At least they'd have one boot. You know, whatever. You know. Yeah. And yeah. this is like, hey, you know. I've seen that. You know, with watches many times, getting their name and details engraved on it. 
case backs okay. or braces, things like that. And how much? And what's the, what's and what is what, how much is that? Two hundred ninety thousand. Oh wow! Wow! Serious, Real money. Serious yeah, it is. You know, I gotta say, Eric, you know, just like I'm promoting the the Turnograph, I hate the Submariner black dials. I uh, I find them so boring. <laughs> But this is a big thing, right? There's a whole, that's a whole, everybody's got, you know, different, you know, this is, yeah, yeah. it's the dream one, right? They want, so 295. Yeah, 290, what, yeah. And what are the, 290, and what are the auction comp, what are, what are the, what does that go in at auction, something like that? What would um, that go for? So it'd probably go around there. The, um, there was earlier, re there's two references, three references total of big crowns, two that are slightly older. This is the third reference of the big crown. The 6200 uh, has a 369 dial, so sort of explorer dial, and 6538 it was the reference that's associated with James Bond, because Sean Connery wore that and Dr. No in the other movies, but um, there are 6200s that have sold for over a million dollars. There's an early 6538 that didn't even have a bezel that sold at Christie's uh, for over a million dollars. Um, so the big crown market's been very soft. Going back to Duke Patel Philippe's question about grail level Rolexes that have come down a lot, the big crown Submariners are very soft right now. People are focused on Paul Newman Daytonas and things. Oh, he's got a, by the way, Duke Phillips, he's got another qu question for you. Ten dollars super chat. Uh yeah. Eric, what I've noticed with vintage is, is you're not seeing great examples anymore. They seem to become becoming more scarce. I'm talking ones that haven't painted hands or is yeah. this true? Yeah, I would say that's true because people with great condition watches are now understanding it. There's a huge premium associated with it and they're harder to find. Uh so it's it's not like I can find an unpolished Pepsi GMT. I don't have any right now. I wish I did because I could probably sell twenty of them, but they're hard to find. Uh, John says uh, he's asking, how long does it take for tritium to change color? It really depends on the watch. Like kind of in the mid '80s, Rolex changed to more of a tritium that's whiter generally and doesn't really change uh, as much. So. But the older ones, kind of 60s, 70s, there is more of a yellowish patina or orange patina in some cases. Um, so yeah, that, just because you have a 90s tritium watch, probably it won't change color at all. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, um, Eric, I think we're out of, ta we're out of time. Uh, I wanna ask you one last question. One last question, actually uh, two last questions. My last yeah, question yeah. is, like, what do you think, if you had to pick one watch right now, brand or whatever, what would be the model brand, let's say under, you know, let's say it's starter, like somebody, you know, that's under 20 grand, what would you say is, is the best pick right now for under 20 grand that you think could, you know, really something that people are, is off the radar, it's off the radar, nobody's watching it, and this could be the next big thing? I mean... It's always a crapshoot with these kinds of questions, but I mean, Universal Genève seems like it's a pretty good brand because they've brought it back. Now there's more interest and stuff, but if we had that this conversation a year ago, Universal Genève was pretty soft, so there wasn't as much interest. I like Volcane Crickets a lot. You can find good ones for under $2,000. They're super cool watch, high quality movement alarm watches, so they they're kind of dressy generally you wear them on a leather strap typically um but really special watches we just put up a large hang on I want, I want to pull it up there's one on your site i i you know i i've heard of volcano right the cricket okay yeah. i think what is it there's a collector was it john goldberg or i think was talking about or something or some guy was talking and the volcano and i was like i never like i don't know like i i'm looking and you have one can you explain where the first let me pull it up and then you can explain to people what this is okay so which one i'm looking here uh i think there's two or three you see this one the thirty three thousand. hang on oh here we go. okay the screen yeah yeah, right yeah. There. that's great we just put that up today it's 38 millimeters it wears like a samariner gmt that's 40 because it's all dial it's huge uh was designed it's really really a special watch um for the price, there's really not anything better, bigger, in my opinion, um, for under five thousand dollars. 
uh, fantastic condition, super crisp, unpolished case. There's no radium. There's a lot of people who are afraid of radium watches kind of pre-1962. The loom is radioactive if it's uh, on there. So it's, um, that was Duke Patel Philippe also mentioned that about radium tile subs, but uh, it's just, it's every, it's got everything you'd really want. And it's an alarm, so it helps you wake up if you need help in the morning. Does it, how does the alarm work exactly? What happens? Does it make a sound or what does it do? Yeah, it makes a loud cricket-like sound. Uh, and oh, it really? corresponds with that fourth hand. That's where the name cricket came from. So it'll wake you up. You know, as long oh, as oh, 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 I see. Oh, it's a cricket because it's probably like that. Oh, okay, because there's something is hitting. Okay. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Really that's cool. interesting. And how do you set this exactly? You got the you got that third hand, the big the hand. Yeah. How does that work? Oh, oh, it's uh, a military okay. time. Oh, that's what happens. No, no, it's not military time. It's um, no. basically the the little dashes on the outside help you set like 10, 30, or fifty minutes. Uh, just so you know, it's like seven thirty or whatever, depending where that okay. hand is with the black tip in this case. So. Okay. Um, you have to wind the crown both directions toward 12 o'clock is actually for the alarm toward six o'clock for the time to wind the alarm mainspring. And then you push the pusher in twice, it pops the crown out and then the that hand with the black triangular tip goes counterclockwise. So you can set the alarm basically up to 11 hours ahead of the current time. And then you push the crown back in and it's activated. So when the hour hand hits the that hand it'll go off uh you know what's interesting is i um i never heard of a uh, i mean i you know i ne doesn't mean anything, but i never heard of vulcan cricket i heard i mean like i heard of universal Geneva. i never heard of this yeah. like, so this is yeah but this, this is, is really this is really niche stuff <laughs> when did they go out of business or they what, what's their history kind of like what's it they, I like a lot of watch companies, they suffered in the quartz crisis in the 1970s, mm -hmm. battery powered watches, et cetera. But they, they still exist. They came back. Uh, they've gone through a number of different ownership changes. I don't really love the new crickets as much as the vintage ones. They're just not the same quality. How, how when they were in their prime, which would be, let's call it the 60s, maybe 50s, whatever, 56, yeah. when was the prime? Um, so the six. first cricket came out at Waldorf Astoria in 1947, and uh, it was immediately sold out. Everyone wanted it because they wanted an alarm watch for when they were traveling, you know, businessmen and things like that. It was very helpful. Uh, so it was very, their pay, heyday was really the 40s through the 60s. And all these presidents How? wore them. Uh, oh, as well. okay, okay. How, so I was going to ask, like basically. I was gonna say, how how would it compare? How would the Vulcan Cricket compare to like what was it of the, of, of the 1950s? It was like was it Rolex Vulcan or where, where where was the ranking? How would it rank in the night in 1958? Eisenhower, Eisenhower, yeah. Ike is in the White House. So you know, Eisenhower wore wore a cricket a lot. He also had a date chest uh, that he wore a lot, gold date chest that Rolex gave him, uh, the 150 thousandth chronometer, I think, that they made uh, with the five stars on the back, but um, he wore the cricket a lot. It was a really helpful watch for people. Um, Truman had one. He was kind of the first president. He had a couple different crickets Then Eisenhower. Supposedly Biden, he, he wears one occasionally even. Um, oh, from where? From the, from, from the 50s? No, uh, the a mo more modern one. More modern. Oh, really? Uh, wow. Yeah. Wait, so, it's, so it's how... Pretty so what was it in its era? Was it like, you know, what was it ranking? What was Vulcan's ranking? Was it like... I feel like, like it was probably, place? it was kind of Patek, Rolex, and then Vulcan in a sense. That's and true. then JL, JLC came out with the Memovox to try to compete with Vulcan uh, in the similar era in the late okay. 40s, early 50s, really early 50s. And the Memovox had its own following. But LBJ was obsessed with alarm watches, even though he typically wore a day date. So he had a bunch of crickets starting in the 50s uh, when he was in the Senate. And he gave crickets away when he was president. And afterwards, he also had a Memovox with the presidential seal on the back. So pretty interesting. Wow, that's that. I, so, so basically, Vulcan was like basically right they up big. there with. They were big. Yeah. Okay, 
Yeah. Then, okay, now I see. Okay, it's a, by the way, I actually I, I like the volcano name. It's a cool name. It's volcano. It, it is like Vulcan. yeah. It means like Vulcan. I don't know what does it mean. It means like Vulcan or something. I don't even of, know, but it's great. It's kind of a. I like that name better than IWC or Universal Jeanette. I mean, it means something <laughs> at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very. It's cool. got something, you know. Uh, so okay, so Vulcan. You're bullish on Vulcan. Is bottom line. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, uh, okay, so I'm going to, re okay, real quick, <clears throat> I'll let you think about this for a second. Is there any, something I, I didn't ask you that you want to mention? For, because we got serious watch people watching. Yeah. Thousands of people are going to see this later. You know, a lot of, a lot of turnograph collectors are going to be watching this, you know, because we're, you know, we're the, <laughs> so uh, yeah. it, what question did I not ask you that you want to bring up that you think people should know about? I'll let you think about for a second. I'm going to thank the show sponsors first while you think about it. Yeah, Chili Badger, two dollars super, two pound super chat. Watch Lux TMZ, two seventy nine super chat. Duke Philippe, ten dollar Canadian super chat. Another ten dollar okay. Canadian super chat. Another ten dollar Canadian super chat from Duke Philippe. Five memberships, ten dollar super chat from Duke Philippe. We got heavy hitters here, Eric. We got yeah. heavy hitters. In That's good. And two cars gifted five memberships. So, okay, now. You ready to answer the question? Well, I've got to ask the question too, I guess. Uh, yeah. Right, because you said what's a question I should ask that. Um, I think um, the biggest, I would say the biggest thing with vintage is just to be very careful where you buy from. You know, if someone was going to ask me what's the most important thing about buying vintage is you've got to know what you're buying and know who you're buying it from and, and work with the person you're buying it from to understand what you're buying. But it's so easy to get burned in this field to buy, you know, reloomed watches, which are worth a fraction of what an original example is worth, polished watches, restored watches. You know, the amount of vintage subs I see on the market with service, super thin numeral bezel inserts. I mean, it's over half of the watches on the market, but the original inserts uh, on some of the 1950s watches can be forty or fifty thousand dollars. So, you, you need just for that little aluminum ring. So, you've got to be buying it from a trustworthy person. Uh, you know. Okay. By the way, I actually it, uh, that actually is a very valid point because look, I mean, I've bought from you, right? I bought this the turnograph here. Yeah. Everything was. Crisp. I mean, I did see it in person. That gives me a little bit of a you know. I did see it in person, but still, you know. And, and here's the thing. I again, I'm not trying to like you know blow smoke up up, but. Uh, the fact that you give your buyers this really nice pouch, like an this is a good quality pouch, that That's says so you're really, you're not you know you're not trying to cut corners like you. This is a, it's listen, it's the small things that make a big difference. I had yeah. now with you had a good experience. Price was good, everything was good. I bought a watch from a guy I saw on Chrono, um, and uh, he a, a Patek Ellipse. And mm -hmm. uh, it came with and the pictures. He didn't show me that the bracelet. It was one of those on the on the integrated, and it was oh, cut down. Wow. For me, wow. it was good, which was good. But yeah. but he didn't show me in the pictures because it, because the the case was so crisp. Everything was so it really was crisp. The case, yeah. unbelievable condition. I didn't see that the crown guard was not the original Patek crown guard, and which they all had a Patek logo on the crown guard from 1972. Yeah. They would have that, no? Um, yeah, have crown. And this guy is a, supposedly, you know, he's on Instagram. He's like, you know, a re supposedly reputable guy. And I emailed him and said, hey, man, this is not the, there's no crown. There's no, where's the Patek crown guy? I never, and he said, oh, no, that's, the, you know, it's like, oh, man, this is like very, it was very, you know, so, I mean, I, I would never go back to that guy because it's just like, yeah. come on, it's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, you got to, you got to be careful with people who you deal with, with vintage. Uh, and we know we've seen people in the audience, they bought from you. Uh, we've got, uh, so, Okay, I'm gonna leave it on this comment. Eric does all the investigating, so you don't have to worry. He's he's the best. Okay, I concur. I you know my, in my experience, it was good. Eric, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. I appreciate thank you, it again. Thank, thank you all for listening. Back. Thank you everybody for watching. See you in the next one.